Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as stated, my name is David Good, and I'm a senior project manager of Transport for Greater Manchester. And for the last three and a half years, I've had the privilege challenge of delivering the Oxford Road project, which I'm sure you've all felt that pain of at one time or another. Um, it's fair to say I've never stood on this side of the legislature before, so go easy. Um, <laughs> the presentation that I've got for you today is really around some of the, what have been the key challenges for the delivery of the corridor, which I think you'll all probably be intimately aware of to one extent or another, given um, where you work and what study. Um, and I want to talk a little bit around kind of how we've got about delivering such a major transformational project on um, a corridor that has the, the profile and challenges that Oxford Road does. Um, clearly, I'll, I'll touch on the benefits um, and I can go into those a little bit in more detail at the end if people so wish, because also in this, this presentation is kind of more geared towards the delivery angle, but I can certainly pick those up um, as I go along. And if there's anything that I, I don't cover, then please feel free to ask questions at the end. So in terms of what I'd like to cover, or we will cover, a little bit around the sort of context, which I'm sure you'll all be quite well aware of, the challenges of delivering a project of this type, a bit around the, the corridor profile itself, the key changes that the project has introduced, from our perspective, the success requirements, so what did we need to get right to deliver it correctly, and I'll probably do a better that than myself, in, an inclusive design, um, as one key aspect of the project, um, making sure that it's fit for purpose and it works for all users of the corridor. And I've got two particular aspects I want to touch on in relation to that one around the access restrictions, the other being the site bypass lanes. Talk about communication and the exercise that we've undertook and continue to undertake in terms of how we communicate the works to the partners and to the affected users. Leading off from that stakeholder management and then, as you'll have felt the pain of in the last. 18 months or so, how we dealt with the construction phase and the interfaces that that's required. So just by way of a little bit of context, people may or may not be aware that Oxford Road is actually just one project in a much wider programme that uh, TFGM are responsible for delivering. <coughs> we refer to that as the Bus Priority Programme. It's roughly £120 million pounds worth of capital works and extends over the uh, coverage that you can see on, on the map on the screen. So across to the um, to the west, so on the uh, on the left of the map, you can see Lee, Atherton, and Tilsley. As many of you may be aware, TFGM have, within the last couple months, completed uh, the North West First Guided Busway, which uh, runs from um, Lee to Atherton um, and feeds directly into the A580. There's then works that have been undertaken on the A580 uh, that runs through Salford to connect back into the city centre. There have been works that are taken on the A664 Rochdale Road, which leads north to Middleton. Both of those routes then connect in the regional centre, and there have been works carried out on Portland Street in the last 18 months, two years. And then, crucially, in the reason we're here today, they then link down to Oxford Road. The rationale for all of this being that it was around providing dedicated plus priority investment that would provide and enable um, seamless bus journeys and bus bus services from Middleton in the north and Lee and Atherton in the um, west and through the city centre down on Oxford Road um, to serve the corridor as we know it, the universities um, and uh, to serve a destination point at the hospital, which is where ultimately the cross city services will terminate. The services have already started running, they are running um, and their skeleton service at the moment, but that's, that frequency will increase on the 23rd of April, so I think it's around seven services an hour will run from those destination points down up to the road and that will see the conclusion of the, uh, the programme, if you like, and the realisation of the, uh, the overall programme benefits. In terms of the challenges of the delivery on Oxford Road, as I'm sure you're probably all quite well aware, it has a very well established corridor profile in itself. It's predominantly defined by its transport movements, its transport profile, and it's got a very strong economic and political landscape. So in terms of how we deliver a project like this on a corridor like Oxford Road, the key challenges are around the particular stakeholder making for the corridor, so there's obviously the universities, the hospitals, there's a lot of key cultural um, facilities and assets in terms of the College of Music, the Contact Theatre Academy, the University of Aquatic Centre, there's a lot of very influential players that we can take with us um, on the journey, secure their buy-in, 
uh, because without that, we simply wouldn't have been able to deliver the project. And then, having agreed the design with the various partners, there's then, then been the need to secure the necessary highway and legal consent to actually make the changes that the scheme is um, delivering. And then, to actually carry out the works, there's been the need for a variety of network approvals, which are the things you've all been affected by in terms of the closures and the um, and the access restrictions that you are no doubt still feeling the pain of to this day. Wrapped around all of that is obviously the need for clear and effective communication, um, and that's been key to building support for the scheme. And I think it's fair to say that as I stand here today, we've got very good work from the university, both universities and the hospitals, and they've been very key advocates for the scheme and have really assisted in was delivering it. In terms of a little bit around the profile of Oxford Road, if I had a pound for every time somebody told me Oxford Road is the busiest bus route in Europe, I probably wouldn't be stood in front of you today. <laughs> Whether it's true, I'm not so sure. Whether it's ever been true, it's probably this yeah, discussion. But what I do know is it's bloody busy bus movements. <laughs> There's around 3,000 bus movements on the corridor every day, um, 192 movements in the evening peak, um, and that's at the University, the University of Manchester Union stop. Um, 1.6 buses every minute in each direction, and 72% of the travel along the corridor is by bus. So it's fair to say it's very much the dominant mode for Oxford Road. It's also the busiest cycle commuter corridor in Greater Manchester. It carries between 2,000 and 3,000 cyclists a day, which I think is only more evident now that the dedicated cycle lanes are in. You can really see the volumes of cyclists that the route carries. You only have to look at all the cycle uh, stands that I can see from the window. They're located from the Stockwood building just to see how well they're used to get a feel for the level of cyclists on the corridor. Um, and you, you combine those two modes and in effect, the, the non car sustainable modes, if you like, account for 85% of travel along the road. So, really, the investment in the corridor is around targeted investment in the modes that are predominant. And it's about trying to achieve the, the most value for our investment by um, putting money into the modes that are the predominant um, characteristics, if you like, of travel along the corridor. Just want to say a little bit about the, the corridor itself. Um, I'm sure you, many of you are probably aware that Oxford Road is known collectively as, as the corridor within Manchester. Um, it has a clear identity, um, it's got a very strong steer from the uh, partners that uh, make up the corridor. And I've just uh, put a few of the emblems on there to see, as you can see, who um, contribute and drive its development. We've obviously got universities, Brunwood, science partnerships, hospitals, they all meet collectively to drive forward the, um, the various ambitions of the corridor. And it's key that, and it's so it's clear that transport is, is, is a fundamental part to that, and it's um, very much an enabler of the um, kind of the wider economic ambition, and certainly the, um, the capital program you see various partners building at the moment, just by the amount of development sites that you can see around this building, but also further coming up towards the old BBC site. In terms of metrics, around 70,000 students, 60,000 jobs, a GBA of around 3 billion, that's just Itself. Five hospitals within the hospital side of the stones that we're going to do today. I've touched on the fact that there's multiple cultural assets the art gallery, the theatres, the classic centre, college of music, all of which have a high profile and um, rightly so have had a kind of direct influence and say on the development of this scheme. That just gives you an indication of the, um, the extent of the healthcare services on the corridor, and that just serves to highlight that Oxford Road is very much a 24 hour. Seven days a week corridor. Um, there's an A&E facility that obviously works around the clock, and a key part of the scheme has been, has, has been making sure that those facilities continue to function and um, provide the vital services that they do. So in terms of the scale of the changes that we then try to introduce on top of within that context, if you like, probably the key thing and the one that is probably most directly impacts um, and, and employees and use of the corridor is around the general traffic restrictions that we're um, introducing and we've already started to introduce. And this is also the, the key plank, if you like, of the, um, the sustainability credentials of the scheme. So through the, the legal orders that we've um, acquired, we've got a series of restrictions that basically mean that over fairly lengthy sections of the corridor, um, general traffic is prohibited. By general traffic, we mean anything that isn't a bus, a hackney, a carriage, or a bicycle. Um, so the restrictions that are in place operate between 6 in the morning and 9 at night um, and the way we enforce those is through the bus gates that um, 
there's always one in operation at Hunters Road, and um, the photograph on the screen shows that particular one. We've also carried out a lot of carriage way now in the road space allocation. This is obviously one of, always one of the most contentious things to do in terms of transport, reallocating road space that was traditionally used by the motorists to, in the case of Oxford Road, cyclists, uh, pedestrians, and bus users. You'll have noticed that there's been quite a lot of narrowing along the corridor, but it's formed like four lanes in, in most places, it's now two. You can only do that with a lot of um, kind of political and uh, stakeholder support, so that's been a key challenge. <coughs> And also, um, one of the main changes, and again, one of the key planks of sustainability uh, benefits have been the introduction of the segregated cycle lanes and the cycle bypass lanes that we've now got, or will have, the 13 bus stops along the corridor. Um, and that's all the stops from Moss Lane East into Wood Park, right the way through to Portland Street, with the exception of Warren Price and James Dudley, who we simply don't have to win. And the other, one of the key changes is that there's, the whole corridor will now be subject to the central line speed in it. So there's an awful lot of change, and we've always described it as a transformation of the corridor, and it, and it really will has completely transformed the, the landscape of the routes. In terms of our success requirements, well, how, what, what do we need for this to work? The design needs to be inclusive, it needs to fit the purpose as much as it had to work for all the people that use the corridor. That was always going to be key to securing buy-in and support. Um, if people didn't like it, if it didn't work for them, then it was never going to be delivered, and never should have been delivered. Effective communication strategy, so that people understood what we're trying to achieve. And also, as I'll come on to later, um, how we then encourage the behavioural change is absolutely necessary for the back of the capital investment that we're making. And then, having got to the stage of you know what you're building and you told people about it, it's how you then actually um, construct that in a considerate, coordinated fashion. There's an awful lot of requirements in this corridor in terms of how it functions on a day to day basis. There's an awful lot of capital work to be undertaken by other third parties. And how we Coexist whilst still enabling all our objectives to be delivered um, has been a real, a real challenge and has been a real uh, barometer to the success of the project. So, just to touch briefly on one of the design, key design issues that's been around how we've dealt with the access restrictions. Um, in, a, in, in total, it's around the one mile section of the corridor will be restricted to the bus and cycle learning um, section that I, I referred to earlier on. In order to do that, we need fairly um, intensive traffic regulation orders that, that stipulate how people can use the road, there are things that dictate whether you can um, park, when you can load, there are things that you, you need to be aligned, etc. And the orders that were required for Oxford Road in terms of access, if there were substantial objections that remain unresolved, they have the potential to result in a public inquiry, which is a very lengthy process and generally isn't something we wanted to have to. Um, Negotiate because it generally uh, suggests that you've, you did do something that people feel fundamentally opposed to, and that's the last thing we wanted. Clearly, the changes have a direct impact on corridor partners, universities, individual businesses. There's also street trains on Oxford Road that we had to consider the access requirements for, and uh, in community facilities, you've got the Manchester Deaf Centre just at just the corridor. So, there's a lot of very particular um, kind of needs and requirements that have to be taken into account, and we have to make sure that we're delivering or implementing these access restrictions. We weren't hamstring in the corridor and it was still function. So the way, the, the way we went about that was to carry out full access audit of all the properties. So that was literally every property was spoken to, so that we could understand their service and access requirements, we could understand where the nearest disabled access um, parking was, what their particular provision was for um, access to people with mobility issues. All of that was then factored into our design. It proved to be quite a beneficial process in that it helped us to identify unique needs. For example, the building next to the chapel scene still gets oil deliveries from the uh, frontage forecourt. So we need to make sure that we weren't uh, preventing access to the front of the building. And ultimately it resulted in a series of design modifications, including introduction of service loops, so that we could make sure that necessary movements were still enabled. The other thing that it did result in, which was uh, I think definitely beneficial, was that the original proposal was for the restrictions to be 24-7. I think in discussion with corridor partners and, and the universities and certainly the bus operators and the, the taxi hire firms, it was agreed that there was benefit to letting general traffic back in overnight to service the nighttime economy. And certainly from the university's perspective, it was also felt that it's an element of passive surveillance that the students were obviously um, uh, um, using the corridor um, at night. It was beneficial that the corridor wasn't able to be um, kind of um, sterilised by having no traffic and it potentially being 
uh, an area that people could feel threatened within. So the, the move was made to open the corridor to the outside of the country in the evening, which I think has generally been welcomed by all. The result of that process was that we, we were able to uh, negotiate away the minimal, the minimal objections that were received to the legal orders when we advertised them. So that was a huge step forward in, in the, uh, the evolution of the project. Again, that's just an image of the Hatchet Road bus gate. You will see more of these coming over the next two or three months. Um, so I will read with people's staff to adhere to the restrictions that are appearing on signs. Um, <coughs> the council who do enforce these restrictions will start to take action in the coming months um, once the scheme is complete. Incidentally, the people bus gate we've got at Hatchet Road doesn't have a very high level of compliance with around 95% of uh, people actually um, following the, uh, the restrictions. The other major aspect of the scheme um, in terms of design is around the site facilities. As you can see from the photograph um, on the screen, which was taken before the scheme was introduced, tends to get an awful lot of people to be waiting for buses in this area, but it tends to be the majority of students. Um, and that poses an issue around how we manage the interface between buses, cyclists, and pedestrians at the bus stops. Clearly, you've got cyclists passing by on, on, the, on the carriageway in the old arrangement, you then got significant volumes of passengers boarding buses, and you've got significant volumes of buses docking and leaving the stops. So, the key concern is interaction with the stops and the need for dedicated safe spaces, because from a cycling standpoint, while Stops Road is already the busiest cycle commuter corridor, what we wanted to the back of this thing was to grow the numbers of cyclists to increase the cycling profile of Oxford Road. And the way we do that is by introducing new cyclists by um, removing this benefit, which predominantly for cyclists is around safety and perception of danger. And I'm actually that's very much the, uh, I think, affected by the, um, the volume of buses and the need to then um, circumnavigate buses at stops. So we went through quite a long process, which some people around us were involved in. Um, overall, it took around 18 months. And we held a series of 12 design workshops a variety of user groups, cycle groups, um, bus operators, pedestrians, but also a lot of disability reference, reference groups as well, such as guide dogs in the streets, R and IB, um, and then also some of the cycle groups, such as Great Master Cycle Campaign and Love Your Bike. And we started in effect with a black canvas, uh, and we asked people, how would you like these facilities to look? And we considered all aspects, nothing was on the table. We looked at levels, we looked at geometry, we looked at materials, we looked at colour, crossing points, we looked at the segregation methods on the actual carriageway themselves, and that resulted in when you boiled it down into a preferred design. And accepting that that preferred design, uh, particularly in terms of the cycle bypass length of the bus stop, was something that certain users of Oxford Road had never encountered before, and certainly we've never had anything uh, in terms of bypass lanes about that scale in Manchester. What we agreed with partners uh, that we do was to build a trial site. Some of you may recall we built that trial site opposite Havisage, uh, sorry, opposite um, with the park, which is the um, photograph you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, we then took an evaluation of that trial, of that trial location for around four weeks. We carried out um, camera monitoring 24 7 to look so that we could actually physically um, observe the interactions between pedestrians and cyclists. We carried out user surveys and we had a series of technical visits. So we had quite a lot of guide dog um, users and, and cane users come to the site uh, and we observed how they navigated the way around the specific features. Um, the intention being that we would then learn from that because the last thing we wanted to do was kind of replicate any mistakes in 37 locations on the corridor. So an evaluation of what was produced and we've then retrofitted all the remaining stops with the um, outcomes that came out of that trial. It's fair to say it wasn't a great deal, it was, it was more around how we raise awareness amongst the different user groups um, of one another so that people kind of respect each other's space um, and know to learn to look out for one another. So, generally, increased signage and education and awareness where you can raise materials with the, with the key things that are out of them. Another thing just to mention, as you can see from the photograph, is that these bypass lanes are the first cycle lanes in the country to feature several crossings. Um, that was something that came out of discussions that we had at the design stage, and there in there to provide a dedicated point of um, orientation for people with vision impairments. We did discuss around the viability of fully signalised crossings, but they weren't felt to be um, reasonable in the circumstances and probably wouldn't be used as, as intended. Um, but what they do provide with the separate crossings is a point at which there's a lot of riding on the cyclist, 
you will stop um, in the same way you would stop at zebra crossing on the carriageway. Um, and there is further work to be done in terms of how we educate cyclists on the use of these, and then I'll come on to that in a little while. So clearly, making changes at the scale that we have done, and um, given the, the volume of users on the corridor, and the volume of employers and people visiting it on a daily basis, be it for hospital appointments, many of whom are familiar, communication is absolutely key. I think the first point there is the absolutely crucial one from a sustainability standpoint, that as much as we do in terms of capital infrastructure investments, as much as we can make changes to dig up the road, close it, whatever you, however you uh, define it, its, it's success is entirely dependent on the, on the behavioural change um, that accompanies it. If, if people don't understand what you've done, if people don't appreciate the, uh, the intentions behind it, um, and understand the desired outcomes, then on its own, physical infrastructure is very limited in its ability to influence change. And the scale of that change was clearly significant and it impacted everybody on the corridor. So, there's various things that we put in place at DFG, and we have our own and always have our own dedicated communication team that works early on priority. As you can imagine, it's, it's generated a lot of um, interest over the years, so we have a, a dedicated a team of um, communication officers who kind of are the first point for, for dialogue and that will then engage with ourselves um, as required. And what we wanted to do was try to ensure that the conditions were right for change. Um, by ensuring that necessary enabling work was carried out before we started to make changes to Oxford Road. So just very quickly to touch on, you're probably aware of how we had works on the Brook Street and launched in Cambridge Street in around 2014. Uh, that was provided additional capacity that it was uh, felt was required when we actually closed Oxford Road to the <coughs> traffic. Um, there was also localised sympathetic improvements made on launched in Cambridge Street because we accept, we understand that that is predominantly a residential area and what we didn't want to do was um, end up with an increase in um, food traffic on those roads. So in effect, by doing that work in advance, what that enabled us to do was to create the conditions for behavioural change from Oxford Road right at the outset. So instead of a, a traditional civil engineering project where you effectively mind a junction modification, you close that junction for a certain period of time, which I think then come back to it afterwards, what we've tried to do with Oxford Road is, is make the point back from day one that, that ultimately Oxford Road won't be open to general traffic, it will become a public transport priority corridor, but we have already made the improvements in the parallel routes. So what we've tried to communicate is that now is the time to change for use of alternative parallel routes before the actual enforcement comes in, before people are potentially at risk of receiving health charge notices, and that's enabled us to kind of maximise the length of that communication period by, uh, by carrying the food all the construction based on Oxford Road. To do that, we produce quite a wide range of educational awareness raising tools designed to reach um, all the various audience members um, on, on Oxford Road, which is quite a wide variety. So, a wide variety of communication types were developed, and really, in, in how we delivered those, that was that was done building on kind of long established uh, relationships that we have already had in place with the various corridor partners. So, just a few examples of the types of things we've used over the years. The Oxford River Fly has been a very powerful tool. Many of you have probably seen this. I think it's probably had three or four different iterations now. It was produced at the design stage and it's been updated to the final design. This has been a great way of, of trying to describe to people what we're looking to deliver. It's really difficult if you start getting out A not plans and throwing them on the table trying to explain what things will look like because um, even just civil engineers are not always the most intuitive. But this has been a great tool. Um, we've been able to send this on to corridor partners. So, for example, this has been used on the internal uh, TV screens at the hospital um, and it's just a great way of, kind of demonstrating what we're going to achieve. And there's also been opportunities to see uh, as the schemes progress. Again, working with the university, there was the opportunity during the um, commencement of the modification of business school to, to use some of the side of that building to communicate the works that we were about to undertake. And also we use the likes of our bands around the city just to communicate the works, just to try to maximise the exposure and um, create as much visibility in the work as possible. And clearly as the work is developed, there's going to need to produce more detailed communications in terms of maps and visuals that, that demonstrate or they can help to educate people on how to use the corridor. So that might have been through temporary changes, um, where we've introduced a traffic management plan that shows during a particular phase of works how people are required to um, kind of um, 
to respond in terms of diversion routes, but what we've also got a series of permanent access maps that show once the scheme is complete, that the service loops that will be uh, in place to enable the various countries to be accessed. And, and that's information that's going to be available on TFT's website. And we we'll always make the, um, the offer that if there's anything we can work with the partners on to try to produce specific collateral um, that can assist with the internal comms, we're more than happy to assist in that. Anyway, I've got to the cycle counters. This was, this was an opportunity that, that was presented to us through some additional funding that became available. There were a trial for, for Manchester, and, and there were two in place just down by the, the hospital. Um, just up from Denmark Road, and they work basically on loop detection in, in the corridor. And they're just, I think, a very smart communication marketing tool to demonstrate on a daily basis for the cyclists that are using the route, uh, and just to kind of promote cycling as a mode. Um, you can actually, these actually link into a national website, you can actually do a comparison of one location, one city to um, the other locations across the country, and I think actually around Europe where they're installed, so you can actually compare cycling numbers, so it's got quite a useful content tool. To as well, and just the final thing to say from a common standpoint, we're currently finalising animation for Oxford Road, which comes back to the point I made earlier on around how we communicate to people um, the changed behaviours um, that are required to put the scheme to work in the way it's intended. So it's around people kind of respecting each other's space um, and understanding changes and, and using them um, considerably. So that actually, um, those are quite. They're quite old stills. The, the animation is actually pretty much finished now, and we'll be looking to launch that um, next month. Some of you may have actually picked up on our Twitter feed and actually started to um, put out some kind of teaser animations that, that allude to, to the final piece. Just mindful of time, I'll just very quickly touch on some of the construction challenges given the, the scale of the work. I don't think we're going to need to kind of take too much about it because you've probably got the pain more so than anyone else. But ultimately, the scheme has delivered full corridor refresh, building lines, building lines, that's footways, curbways, drainage, carriageway, everything's been replaced. So clearly, to do that, perhaps we've, there's been a need for quite extensive traffic management. Ultimately, that means closure, closures. Um, and those closures, as you can see from the metrics on the scheme screen, are affecting a lot of people. Thousands of cyclists, buses, mass student numbers, and mass numbers of employees. And we appreciate the impact it's had, and that's why we, we do as much as we can to communicate the, uh, the works um, as early as we can. And to that end, what we've done with the corridor partners and universities, we've, whenever we've had a, a traffic management update, we've, we've issued bulletins that show the works that are coming up, um, which we then ask um, the various corridor partners to cascade internally so that at least people uh, have an awareness that closures are coming up uh, and can make alternative plans as much as possible. That said, it's been incredibly challenging. You know, that we recognise the locations on the screen. I mean, as much as possible, we've, we've targeted the work uh, through this section of the corridor over the summer months. We've clearly given the extent of the project. We can't deliver it all within the two and a half month period, so it has had to extend beyond that. But we have obviously targeted the quiet period as much as possible. And we've had to work in, um, very closely with universities and, and, and the and partners to to kind of, kind of almost plan the works by constraint to some degree, so clearly there's a need to avoid uh, particularly disruptive work around graduation periods, exams, resets, welcome week, obviously, which is probably the busiest week in the year, the weeks in the year for the corridor, um, theatre productions, contact theatre, the um, academy have got loading in um, at all hours of the day that we have to accommodate, and during the summer works, we even had to make provision for two wedding parties, so we actually had a bride come through the um, Site compound on a Saturday afternoon, which was facilitated by um, the site operative. So I think I think we've been quite um, kind of flexible and cooperative in the way we've delivered the project, and that's been absolutely key to uh, securing buy-in. And it's it's been really interesting in terms of the, the challenges that it's, it's thrown up. I just I mentioned earlier, but there's an awful lot of other work going on in the corridor. So the photograph there has to be developed. Um, from the BBC site now in the Circle Square. So we've had a lot of direct interfaces with all these construction sites where they've had to carry out utility connections that have been focused on the footways. All of which has required multi-agency cooperation and the need to coordinate traffic management as much as possible uh, and to try to ensure that um, as much work takes place during a given closure as possible to try to minimise the pain for the public. A good example being the recent closure 
for the um, heat network pipes that were um, topped out to vote by NMU, just underneath Mancunian Lane. Way. Uh, you're probably aware of that, it's taken place in the last month. Um, on the back of that circle square, we're currently having a lot of utility connections. We were in there doing as much of our work as possible just to try to maximise the, the, the use of those closures. And as I do agree, again, you visit the school. Um, obviously, in its current format, footprint getting cut on the footway, so we've, we've had a lot of very close years on and, and work uh, close partnership working with uh, Mace and the university around how the two projects can coexist uh, in that location. And just one final point in terms of Oxford, if I've learned one thing, it's that if, um, if something could possibly happen, it will. I'm sure you probably can recall that in 2014 we had a sewer collapse in Oxford Road just in front of the um, hospital, which um, nicely showcased the old tram sets which run the entire length of Oxford Road, which is another issue you've got to consider when you can't be surfaced in the entire length of the All of which can then impose significant delay uh, and aid of third party involvement, and these are all things that we then need to obviously respond to. Um, and try to flex our program to ensure that we, we can still deliver whilst it shouldn't be an ongoing resilience of the network.